My name is Curtis Nickel. I'm a urologist and professor of urology at Queen's University, Kingston, Canada, and Canada Research Chair in Infection, Inflammation, and Pain. I am presenting an introduction to the urinary microbiome, a three-part series. The first part was a primer on the urinary microbiome and microbiome in general. This second part is an introduction of how the urinary uh, microbiome impacts urologic disease. Part three, which follows this uh, lecture, will look at how we can manipulate or adjust our microbiome for urologic health. Now, in part one, we decided based on non-culture, next generation sequencing and other novel state-of-the-art technology that we now know the urinary tract is not sterile. It is a variable microbial jungle. In 2020, we know that we can identify over 4,000 species within the bladder urine itself. Studies have shown that it's difficult to pick what actually is the normal urinary microbiome, but we do know differences in prevalence, diversity between males and females, between different ages, and for females between pre and postmenopausal uh, subjects. Large microbiome studies looking at normal asymptomatic individuals are presently underway, and that's going to help us determine what is an abnormal microbiome associated with urologic disease. It certainly is complicated. We know the specimen collection, whether it's from the bladder, catheterized specimen, urethral or vaginal swabs make a difference. The technology continues to evolve, and we have difficulty sometimes comparing one study to the other because they use different technology. We know that in some instances of chronic or prosthesis-based infection. We have bacterial biofilms, and sometimes all we are uh, looking at or examining are the planktonic bacteria that are floating free in the urine that may not be causing the infection by the sessile bacteria within the biofilm itself. We also understand and are just learning about the microbiome, the fungal presence within the bladder, and the virome, the viral presence within the uh, bladder and urinary tract. I have always been interested in urologic chronic pelvic pain, and in fact started over three decades looking at the impact of bacteria, specific bacteria, and infection on and associated with urologic chronic pelvic pain, such as interstitial cystitis, bladder pain syndrome, and chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome. We came to pretty well a dead wall using 100-year-old technology, plating urine on petri dishes and recording what grew on those standardized culture techniques. With the introduction of novel, non-culture, state-of-the-art technology, such as next-generation sequencing, we have been able to look at other issues in chronic pelvic pain and its association with the microbiome. In the NIH MAP study, we examined the microbiome of 110 patients with chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, and compared them to 115 asymptomatic controls. We found 78 species within these subjects with some variations between the patients and the controls, but really not as much difference as we thought we would find. There were some candidate organisms um, as illustrated here, but they did not appear to be specific for many patients with chronic prostatitis, just some. So we're still working on the implications of the microbiome for chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, and believe it's more of a pattern or dysbiosis issue if it is, in fact, associated 
with the diagnosis, and propagation, and or severity of this particular urologic pain syndrome. In our female bladder pain syndrome study, with hundreds of ICBPS patients compared to asymptomatic controls, we did note a difference in mean relative abundance of ICBPS versus controls, as can be seen from this uh, somewhat complicated figure. But we only had really one candidate organism, and it was only a candidate organism in a, in, in a number of ICBPS patients, Lactobacillus casseri, that appeared to be more predominant. But it perhaps could be the ecology or a dysbiosis that's associated with, with this. What we did notice that when we looked at interstitial cystitis, bladder pain symptom patients who were in a flare, there was a significantly greater prevalence of fungi in the microbiome or microbiome in the flare group. We subsequently did an extended flare fungal study using um, NGS, and we were able to look at 202 females with and without flares with ICBPS. And we did note that fungus or the microbiome does appear to be relevant in some patients with ICBPS. When we looked at IC Hunter lesions, we could see that there were species differences between Hunter lesion patients and non-Hunter lesion patients. However, that's overshadowed by strong differential clustering of species based on gender, which appear to be more important. But there were differences between HL, Hunter lesion, and non-Hunter lesion patients, not with a specific putative organism, but more the type of urotype that we saw between these two um, urologic conditions. We now are looking at symptomatic subject cluster analyses. And this is on 71,000 specimens that I have access to in the Microgen DX database. And we've been able to find four community state types or urotypes within those 71,000 microbiome analyses. We note that there are differences between males and females. And what we're doing now is trying to figure out, based on the diagnosis, realizing, of course, it was a coded diagnosis for these analyses, whether or not any of these specific community state types or urotypes actually correspond to a specific urologic uh, inflammatory or pain disease. Others have shown, in fact, there's quite a good body of literature that there is a link between the bladder microbiota and female lower urinary tract symptoms. This has been shown with urinary uh, urgency incontinence, the response to treatment in overactive bladder, and post-instrumentation and post-surgical urinary tract infections. The fact is, again, it's not a specific organism, but it appears to be a pattern of organisms that links the microbiome to female LUTs. Recently, research groups have shown there's a link between the bladder microbiota and the degree of lower urinary tract uh, symptoms in males as well. A more complicated picture, but there is definitely a pattern arising that LUTs in males and females are associated with patterns in the microbiota. We now know that urolithiasis is intimately associated with the urinary microbiome. This particular slide that I presented from our work almost 30 years ago shows that association we all know with struvite stones, where an adherent biofilm of urolytic bacteria in the kidney or the bladder ends up through um, you know, alkalization of the urine with deposition of struvite uh, and other crystals within the biofilm. We end up getting uh, seams of bacteria within crystal aggregation and end up with a mineralized macrocolony 
almost a type of living urinary coral. Well, it turns out that calcium oxalate stones may also be associated with microbiomes. Interestingly, microbiome in the gut. There's an inverse relationship between intestinal colonization with old formagenes and the development of calcium oxalate stones. Colonization with uh, this particular bacteria is associated with a 70% reduction in urolithiasis risk. Others have shown that there may be a combination dysbiosis. You remember the malfunctioning ecology in urinary stone disease. And that can occur in the gut, as we just described. It could be in the urinary tract, we shift from one type of urotype to another type of uh, community of bacteria. Or the stones themselves can be dominated by different types of bacteria. So we end up with this dysbiosis in the gut, the urinary tract, and the stones themselves that can uh, propagate urinary stone disease. Now the big topic is urinary cancer in the microbiome. We know that cancer develops and progress is uh, through an interplay between the normal and tumor cells in this extracellular environment in the prostate, in the bladder, in the kidney. Now, bacteria and bacterial products controls tissue homeostasis, inflammation, in fact, controls a lot of the signaling that happens in this extracellular environment. Long-term dysregulation caused by bacterial dysbiosis might result in a pro-tumorogenic environment, and we end up with urologic cancer, at least that's the theory. In bladder cancer, a number of studies include presented at the AUA or recently published has shown that the urinary microbiome pattern identified with patients with frequent recurrences compared to those with no recurrences are different. And that there are urinary microbiome patterns associated with a better clinical response to BCG immunotherapy. A recent study has shown that the microbiome may be different in patients with bladder cancer who develop superficial versus invasive uh, bladder cancer. So the microbiome might be involved in the pathogenesis, in the uh, severity or propagation, or even in the response to treatment. Prostate cancer uh, can also be associated with prostate inflammation. And what causes prostate inflammation more than anything else? Well, infection. So what you can see in these slides is that persistent infection, perhaps small areas of bacterial microcolonies or biofilms, or more generalized prostatitis causes ductal interductor or interstitial inflammation, which may lead to a series of pathways in that particular slide that you cannot hardly see and interpret on the right, uh, and we end up with cancer of the prostate. Again, that's the hypothesis or theory. But again, with everything else with the microbiome and our present knowledge, it's more co complicated. This is a, a slide from Dr. Crawford's and his associates work on prostate cancer, looking at urine specimens uh, in patients with cancer and those controls. And there were patterns that we could see and specific organisms that we can see that were more predominant and abundant in the cancer specimens than in specimens from controls without cancer. But if we look at the recent microbiota and prostate cancers, uh, studies using PCR or next generation sequencing, using uh, urine, rectal swabs, fecal specimens, tissue, prostatic fluid. What we see is bacteria that appear to be associated with cancer. The problem is, if you look on the right, you will not see the same bacteria in the urine studies versus the fecal studies, versus the prostatic fluid studies. 
So we're not getting concordance or confirmation of studies, um, findings with the various uh, publications. And this is problematic, but hopefully will sort itself out as we understand the prostate and lower urinary tract microbiota better. So again, we come up with this same slide from part one. Is this little fellow, this E. coli dividing in the bladder, our friend or our foe? Well, it appears he can be both. The bladder, prostate, and probably even the kidney are microbial jungles whose objective is to keep their host, that's us, alive and healthy. But when things go awry, we end up with urologic disease, lower urinary tract symptoms, urologic pain syndromes, urinary stones, and perhaps even malignancy. In part three, we're going to discuss how we can manipulate our microbiome for urologic health. Thank you.